Welcome everyone. My name is Paul Mitchell and this is the 2021 um, Ag Outlook Forum. This is the livestock panel and um, meat panel. Um, today we've got four panelists so we're going to keep things moving and we're going to start with Brenda Botel. She's a professor and chair of the Agricultural Economics Department at UW-River Falls and Extension Agricultural Marketing Specialist. She pre-recorded video. I hope you've had time to watch that. It's on the Rank Agribusiness Institute page. Brenda, I appreciate, um, thank you for pre-recording that video and I'd like to go right at it. Um, Things have changed. It's been a week already. Do um, you have any um, anything you'd like to update or change about what you said a week ago, um, just based off of what's happened here in the last um, week? Well, you know, last week, it, it's it's changed slightly since then, um, not terribly. Uh, we did have a couple new reports come out. So we had the cattle and feed report that came out last Friday, and we had the cold storage report that came out yesterday. Um, in those, basically what we're seeing, um, it was a little bit of a surprise, uh, a little bit on the on the placements there. It's not um, as bad as could have been. The biggest thing is that, you know, the report really just reiterated that we are really behind on um, placing some of those feeder cattle as we saw that those weights are getting higher. Um, it's a little bit more than what we were anticipating. So maybe we haven't quite ca caught up. We're having still a little bit more of the sluggishness still for 2020, but we're getting there. Um, we're getting through all of that backup that we saw um, because of the pack down from, shutdown from the packers. The other thing that we saw in the reports yesterday is that we actually have a lot more beef um, in cold storage. So um, although right now, so 2020, we were still buying beef, even with those really high prices, we're potentially starting to see um, where we're storing some of that now. And if we continue to produce higher amounts of beef and don't market that product, that's going to have a lot of some pressure on some retail beef that maybe I wasn't really expecting when I was putting that report together earlier. Yeah, um, okay, so it wasn't as dramatic. I know the grains and the um, particular dairy had some um, reports in the last week that really changed things for them. Um, just thinking about um, beef farmers, because that's our, after dairy, it's our next um, largest commodity here in the state in terms of um, value of production. Can, when can we expect some positive margins for um, fed cattle here in the state? Um, do you have a sense on sort of the long term where those prices for into 2021 are going? So um, it really kind of depends. If you're looking at finishing cattle, if you place them in December and you had done some marketing on with some of the grain prices and getting those feeder prices, you know, there's some potentials for some slight margins for those that you placed in December. It's going to be pretty tight for the first part of the year. So if you're placing them in January, February, March, because of those higher costs of grain and those feeder cattle prices and that, yet yeah, we're going to see those negative margins for those um, for those pack not packers, excuse me, for those producers, for those live cattle producers. Um, by the end of the year though, um, hopefully we'll start to see because of the potential for the increase in the live cattle price by the end of the year. Um, if that keeps up and the grain prices and the feeder cattle prices don't go more than what we're expecting, then we should be able to see some, again, some positive margins by the end of the year. Now, obviously the caveat on this is, you know, with grains um, and where they're gonna go um, and what's gonna happen with the corn prices in there. Yeah, I, I, I know there's gonna be a lot of questions about where grain markets are going and that's gonna have a big impact on, well, dairy and beef for, for, um, actually. Um, what about these cow-calf operations and people selling feeder cattle? Um, where are their margins going, do you think? How is 2021 likely to shape up for them? So some of the bigger issues that we saw is again, because of 2020 and the shutdown with the Packers, you know, that, that backed everything up. And because people weren't able to market the, the finished animals, then that delayed the being able to place those feeder animals. Um, and we're still seeing that, as I said, you know, those aren't very current, those feeder animals as we're placing those, those are heavier weights than what we've seen. Um, and that's just because they've been being um, held up, you know, before they get put into the feed yard. Uh, as we walk through this, as we get through this, um, what we saw is in 2019 and 2020, we did have smaller size calf crops. And so that will give potential and that will give the prices for those to be able to increase here. But that's probably not going to be again until, you know, where we see this seasonal increase and back to normal increases due to that lower amount until the latter part of this year. But by then we should be looking at um, positive margins. The biggest thing that we have to look at for cow-calf is um, out west, what we're seeing is drought. And yeah. when we see that drought is the issue is, are they going to start culling those animals faster? And that can 
Where are we looking at hay stocks being really tight? And if we continue on that drought, that's going to have an impact then in that industry. That's a good point. Um, but let, yeah, I've heard that on the grain side. They're really concerned about that drought, sort of almost the western half. Um, I mean, even in Iowa last year, the, the drought started to be an issue in the western Corn Belt. Um, well, overall, we've been talking about beef, but it sounds like, you know, there's a large um, slug of beef cattle to, and feeder cattle to move through the system. Um, but, you know, cattle have a lot longer lifespan. Do, when do you sort of, you're talking the end of the, into the second half of next year, of this year, but when do you see a return to normalcy or stability for the beef, you have, I guess you've heard about, but like for hog and especially poultry markets um, here, do you have a sense of normal, when is that going to happen? Okay, so, well, exactly. As, you know, they had the same issues with some of the packer problems um, that we saw in 2020. Because of the, the lag um, isn't quite as long for them because the, the production life cycle for those animals isn't nearly as long. We will get through that a little bit faster. Um, so from the hog side, from a year over year, it's not to say that we are going to suddenly have enough um, slaughter capacity just because of the number of animals there, but we're still looking at that not having those COVID style impacts probably um, by about the second quarter of 21 for, for hogs. You know, it's going to take until the second ladder or the second half of the year for cattle before we see that COVID impact um, disappear. And that makes the assumption that packers are continuing at the pace that they're at right now. And there's no additional shutdowns or no unexpected shutdowns. Well, I'll let you ask them about that. We've got a few on here. Um, so, uh, no, uh, some people that know. Um, all right. Well, thanks, Brenda. We'll, we might be back with you again. I'm going to switch next to Jeff Sindelar. He's a professor here in the Department of Animal and Dairy Science. Yes, you heard that. Those departments have merged. It's Animal and Dairy Science. Um, and, and Jeff is also Extension Meat Science Specialist. So, Jeff, um, can you spend a few minutes explaining, um, just telling us about your research and your outreach program here at the university for the audience who might not know who you are? Sure, Paul, I'd be happy to. Um, so uh, again, Jeff Sindelar uh, in the Department of Animal and Dairy Sciences, and I work specifically in the uh, Meat Science and Animal Biologics Discovery Building, which I'll explain a little bit more a little bit later on. So uh, my job is um, a professor and extension meat specialist. Most of my job is extension, uh, meaning that I am a resource for the meat industry in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, and I support the meat industry's uh, viability and growth in a multitude of ways. Uh, I work with everyone from the future meat eaters, um, the kids, uh, all the way to adults. I work directly with the meat industry uh, and then the various entities that support the in this industry, including the regulatory branches, uh, supply industries, uh, other collaborators on and off campus and wherever there's an opportunity to support the industry in the state of Wisconsin. My research program, which is a smaller component of my program, is um, strategically aligned with my extension program uh, to, again, support the industry. And so I typically um, am interested in uh, researching areas that have uh, a, a immediate direct impact, uh, essentially identifying questions that exist, finding funds uh, to um, work through those questions, and then providing results that can be implemented in the industry uh, that are often um, uh, reviewed uh, and considered acceptable, um, scientifically based by regulatory uh, agencies as well as others. Uh, and then I do lots of other fun stuff uh, in my uh, free time. Uh -oh. All right, thanks. Um, one thing I, you know, we the the, the disruptions in the meat um, processing, you know, taking livestock and turning that into meat and uh, meat-based foods made national attention. I talked yeah. about briefly in my opening comments. You likely saw the meat processing disruptions from a different perspective. Somebody more of an insider and someone using university and your um, intellectual resources to help address the problem for the state and maybe broadly for the, the nation. Um, what is something yeah. that most people don't know about what was happening in the meat processing as a result of the pandemic that you wish they did? Yeah, so you are correct. I did have a, have, have, have a chance to watch all this unfold from a little bit of a different perspective and a little bit of a, of a different view. I, um, uh, through my channels and some of the work that I did, which was um, uh, doing a lot of interviews and trying to um, uh, support the comforting aspect of what was going on with the pandemic early on, uh, I really realized and wish that, 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 many, real, that, that, that many people 
that uh, were either involved with knee-jerk response of purchasing, purchasing, or trying to find products, you know, in this very um, uh, uh, volatile time, uh, would, uh, you know, simply relax, as well as understand that there is a lot of people doing a lot of things to try to stabilize the food system and make sure that the food system, first and foremost, is safe for all consumers. And secondly, make sure that the, that, 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 that those are those uh, individuals, uh, frontline workers, as well as many others who are involved directly with manufacturing those food products were also safe. And you know that, that, that initiative carried all the way to Washington, D.C., and then carried all the way down to the local level uh, from the largest plants in Wisconsin to, 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 to the very smallest. And, and everyone was, was, was and has continued in some fashion work just timelessly and, and so hard to ensure that the safe, nutritious, wholesome, and right following the volatility of the markets, relatively inexpensive, and especially when you compare it to the rest of the world, that all those comp really important components uh, still may re re remain intact, even though there was a lot of stress on that system, uh, especially earlier on in 2020. Yeah, I think a lot of people, I mean, literally were freaked out. You saw the runs on some of the different, and, and they were worried, where's the, my food gonna be? Um, and meat was one of the things yeah. they were interested in. Um, can you think of some of the vulnerabilities we saw as a result of um, what of the pandemic? Um, and maybe you can, some thoughts on how we might address them? Yeah, so definitely a number of vulnerabilities were realized and, and, and some are new, some are just existing that really became uh, kind of frontline and obvious uh, because of the pressures of the pandemic, first and foremost is is, is probably workforce um, and the um, lack of worse workforce that has continually uh, dissolved or or, or decreased uh, over time uh, in the meat industry. And this is not only local in Wisconsin; it's 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 it's, it's, it's a national issue. But the pandemic really made that very clear, obvious, a frontline issue, and really put many many establishments. Uh, uh, in, in, in some really um, um, challenging situations just to keep the doors open. So that, that would probably be the, the, the first and foremost. The second is, is, is probably the, the facilities themselves, right? Uh, the meat industry in Wisconsin is, is really dynamic, very small plants, very large operations, everything in between, and a whole array of ages from brand new state of the art to eh, ones that are you know, more legacy models, right? And so, so the pandemic, especially 2020, has really re has really made uh, many realize that you know there, there there really needs to be an investment in the state of Wisconsin um, uh, to um, um, you know update facilities, uh, provide support for those that want to build new facilities, as well as help support additions, renovations, and so forth. All right, thanks. Um, we'll come back to you. I want to hear more about this new meat science building. Um, next up, I'd like to ha hear from Jake Seiler. Um, he's at Seiler's Meats in Elmwood, Wisconsin. And Jake, um, thanks for participating today. I, I know you're stuck in the Quad Cities on your way back and then the weather got in the way. Um, can you just spend a few minutes talking about who, Seiler Meats and what it, what it does and what you do there? Yes, good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you for, uh, for asking me to do this. Um, good morning, my name is Jake Seiler from Seiler's Food Market in uh, beautiful downtown Elmwood. Uh, we're lo located up in uh, western Wisconsin, kind of outside of Minneapolis, St. Paul, 28 miles into Wisconsin and uh, 11 miles south of 94. Um, Seiler's Food Market is a fourth generation family business in Elmwood. My great grandpa started it back in 1923. Um, I'm the fifth generation of our family and fourth in Elmwood. So uh, when I took it over with my dad, mom and dad, or I should say my wife, my mom and dad took it over from my grandpa in 1995. We had seven employees, five of us were family, and now we have uh, 33 um, on the average, more or less. We started uh, state inspection slaughter back in 65, and today now we are a USDA processing facility. Uh, we do custom processing, retail, uh, wholesale, and a lot of private label. So currently, uh, my wife, Leslie, and I, well, we own the business. We have two children, Sam is 11, our son Sam is 11, Morgan is uh, 14. So hopefully we can continue that uh, family legacy a little bit. So we built a new facility back in 2006. We built a 10,000 square foot facility in Elmwood. 
And uh, we probably outgrew that approximately eight years ago, crazy to say. <laughs> and now we're looking at uh, building a new 50,000 square foot facility on a property that we bought uh, just south of 94, 10 miles north of where we're at now, uh, just outside of the Twin Cities. So that's kind of my story. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, you're, I would call this is a small business. Um, this is definitely in local foods. Um, that's definitely what you are an example of. Um, you were right in the middle of things when COVID-19 hit. Um, you know, the meatpacking was in disruption. You, the national headlines are talking about euthanizing, you know, millions of animals. Um, what was it like there at Siler's um, in the middle of this pandemic? Um, how, tell us what your experience was. Uh, it was crazy, straight up crazy. Um, at, at that point, I always thought we'd been busy and we were always busy. Well, that changed everything. Uh, we saw that our store, our retail store was just filling up with people uh, buying meat products and sausage products. It was just kind of crazy the way people wanted to buy and put things in their freezer. I, I, it was really weird. Um, the phone just totally rang off the hook, wanting to slaughter animals, get their animals booked. And we were already full, we were already busy. Um, the crazy part about it all was, was we were right in the middle of our hog sale. We have an annual hog sale every year. And we usually sell 600, give or take, 600, 650 hogs a year. And when Smithfield shut down and the supplier, the guy that we buy our hogs from, for, uh, when he didn't have a place to take his hogs, we thought we would step up to the plate a little bit and we extended our hog sale for nine days and hoping that Smithfield would be back online. We sold over 350 hogs in those nine days and in our whole seven week hog sale, we sell well over a thousand hogs. Um, that was kind of crazy. When JBS stop slaughtering cattle. You know, we have a, a local dairy with, uh, with an off, I think they have like 4,000 cows. You know, they, they didn't have a place to take their, take their dairy cows. And so we started literally working Saturdays. Um, we, well, we still killed twice a week. We started working Saturdays just to bone cows to help other processors within the state who could not buy those raw materials from JBS. So we were shipping up combos of boneless trim we were killing extra cows for other companies who could come in and, and take them out as halves or quarters, and then they could bone them out and buy those raw materials. So it was, uh, it was kind of a win-win for everybody. Uh, the nicest thing about it all was that, you know, we saved that hog farmer because I did not quit paying him for those hogs from when Smithfield shut down, we continued with that price and he was just a happy camper. And uh, so we saved him and uh, it was, but it was, it was definitely trying times on everybody. I mean, it's been going on now for nine months and everybody's getting tired. <laughs> yeah, I think some of the COVID fatigue, I'm thinking there's several yes. people in the meat processing and there's other industries that the essential workers that are facing COVID fatigue. I think our medical workers are probably way ahead of you guys yet on COVID fatigue. Um, the other thing I'd like to, you know, I mean, by, I think by definition, you guys really fall under small and local foods. And we hear so much talk um, all around the country and it's just local, local, local is good. Um, suppose someone wanted to expand or start a new meat processing plant, you know, to take local animals and turn them into food for their um, local people in their community. Um, what barriers do you see for local meat processors like yourself or others that want to take, get, move into this industry or expand? What can be done to I help see people? Yeah, I see uh, right now, I see two major, two major problems and, and one is maybe funding and the other is labor. Uh, what I mean by that is, is that banks need to look at, uh, say myself as an existing business, or they have to understand that a new business coming in doesn't, isn't gonna have a track record. Um, banks believed in companies like me 15 years ago when we put, our, put up our new facility and, and it's not the same now, even for myself, let alone other people that I know that are trying to build new facilities. Um, the need for more slaughter capacity is there. It is continually gonna grow for the next however many years. Um, and how do you build a, a platform or a, a business plan for a bank to understand that you can't give them that information until you build it? Because if you build it, they will come. Uh, that was one of the things that I, that I truly believe in. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to justify 
what the next two years are going to bring because you look at a company like us and i know it's not just in wisconsin it's all over the country but we are literally booked to capacity for the next two years and that makes it very difficult when we could build a new facility or take on more animals hire more employees things like that so uh labor labor in the meat sector is also has always been a problem um, I can, I'm afraid that it's going to continue to be a problem and it's all over the country. It's not just here. Um, but we need, we need that labor force to come in and we will teach them that trade. Um, that's all we have at this point is to bring them in, teach them, train them and get them interested. Um, I'm, I'm optimistic for the new meat lab things. We'll talk about that. Um, but the other biggest problem for businesses like me is, uh, is affordable healthcare. And for us to be able to be competitive in the workplace, to pay good wages and full benefits, we have to be able to have some health care that we can afford. And uh, at this point, it's very difficult. All right, thank you. Yeah, um, I, we were on the previous panel, um, I was speaking with um, John Lucy about some of the programs that they have for helping b dairy businesses expand, you know, a cheese plant or a, uh, somebody making, I don't know, cottage cheese or a, a milk beverage or something. And there are programs for them that just, he didn't think there's a, the same programs are out there for meat processors. and. Um, I th it sounds like we could really use some smaller to mid-size to larger size capacity building here in the state on meat processing. Um, I'm going to jump to Kevin, then we'll come back to everyone here. Um, um, next up is Kevin Ladwig. Um, he's, he's officially his current job is he's venture. He's the manager of the venture fund for Johnsonville Holdings. But Kevin, could you explain a few minutes what that means and sort of your history in the meat processing um, world? You've, you've, you've been on the, active in it for years. Um, just describe what your time is at Johnsonville and now where you're going, what you're doing with this Johnsonville Holdings Venture Fund. Yeah, sure thing, Paul, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so I, the easiest way to say this is I landed at Johnsonville in 1988 and haven't left, and probably more importantly, I haven't been asked to leave. So I've been here <laughs> a long time. I've had a front row seat watching the company kind of grow up in many respects. About 200 employees or members, as we call our employees at Johnsonville, to about 2,500 today. So I'm a meat scientist by training. In the early part of my career, I really focused on the sciences. So things like research and development and food safety quality really made up my first 10 years at Johnsonville. Transitioned to the operation supply chain side. So as we're building out our network from not just national distribution, but also international. And today we're in 40 countries. Spent a lot of time in the operation side of our business. The last 10 years was really marked by spending time in external facing roles like um, sales, marketing, business development, and M&A activity. So I've had a good fortune of working from front to back within the company. Uh, I know the company well, and it's just been a fantastic <clears throat> ride for me here at the company. Um, Johnsonville is family owned, it's privately held. Uh, it's been around since 1945. And about three years ago, we started thinking more deeply about a venture fund and a family office. And I was asked to slide over and lead that because of my tenure at the company. And really, we try to focus on a couple main areas. Uh, the first is emerging technologies. Anything that we think we can use at Johnsonville, the operating company, to make it more competitive is certainly of interest to us. Um, Jake talked about labor and the shortages of talent. It's certainly widespread across our industry. Uh, robotics could be a good example. So if there's an interesting company that has robotics, we perhaps are investing in that company and bringing their technology to Johnsonville to make us more competitive. It could also be packaging materials. It could be anything uh, that's in the consumable category. Anything that we can use at Johnsville as an emerging technology to make ourselves more competitive is certainly within our, our venture arm uh, wheelhouse. And the other area that's, that's really important to us is the broader life sciences area. We have three harvest plants within Johnsville that supply a lot of the meat. And there's a lot of byproducts that are traded from these operations. And what we're attempting to do is find companies who need these byproducts Traditionally, they've gone to rendering, which is still a very large business. But more and more, there's areas like regenerative medicine in the medical device space or pharma space, which is in need of porcine tissue. That's what we process. And we look for companies who can use this material, will make an investment in the company for an equity stake. And in that regard, we're helping them by supplying the material. The first example I gave is where really we're a customer of anything that's, uh, that's emerging technologies that might apply to our business. So. We're really staying tight to the operating company, trying to make Johnsonville more competitive in both of those two areas. And today we've made about 20 investments in our venture arm. 
do you have some of your own company R&D as well, or is it all outsourced, if you will, looking at these entrepreneurs and emerging companies that you just um, go out and invest in and purchase maybe someday? Yeah, Paul, we have a really deep R&D team, some 30 people here that spend their time trying to make our products better or develop new products uh, to, to add to our portfolio. So that's certainly a, a big push for us internally here through innovation, through developing new products. We also have a very deep engineering team, which spends a lot of time looking at equipment and technologies in that space. We really use the venture arm to supplement that. Um, so you can't be good at everything. You can't uh, certainly stretch into every possible area you'd like to. We don't have a lock in all the good ideas. So there's a lot of really interesting startup companies in this space that have really intriguing technology that we think we can be early adopters uh, with and bring the companies in and use that technology here. And then my job is to take it beyond Johnsonville to the broader marketplace. So Johnsonville invests, we use this technology to supplement our internal resources. We use it here. And then my job is to expand that to the broader marketplace to take the technology elsewhere. So certainly have a lot of technology, a lot of people working hard on R&D internally here, but Venture Armor is a way to supplement that. I see. I see. That's, that sounds. Uh, you sound like you have your um, finger on the pulse of the, the of meat processing and, and broader uh, manufacturing. I, I think you're right. Wisconsin has a lot of um, engineering talent out there, and a lot of these manufacturing, not just in meat, but uh, all the other things we do here um, in food processing as well as just broadly manufacturing. Well, I'd like to swing back to Jeff here. Um, we've already kind of touched on it. Uh, the, the dean mentioned it in her opening comments. If you watch that video, there's been two big. Uh, new things here at the University of Wisconsin, the Dairy Innovation Hub, and then the Meat Science and Animal Biologics Discovery Building. You guys got to work on a better name for that one. We need something that rolls <laughs> off the tongue. Maybe we need a, a, a rich donor to give us a name. We can just call it the, the we'll call it, but not me, but you know, the Mitchell Lab or something like that. We need somebody, because that's a mouthful. Meat Science and Animal Biologics Discovery Building. Um, give us a little story about what that is and what, what we should expect coming out of that. Sure, Paul. So. Uh... Uh, definitely, it is a mouthful, but believe it or not, the name of the building uh, went through uh, a very lengthy exercise, very strategic exercise to arrive at what it is. And you know, if, you know, and if you break down break down the name meat science, that's our discipline, right? We work on the latter part of animal agriculture from the time the animal is essentially no longer alive until it's put into a consumer's mouth or or or, or a cold product from it is utilized for something some other purpose, such as such as what Kevin was, was introducing. Animal biologics is a field uh, which is rooted in, in, in basic core meat science or muscle biology. Uh, this is this new area that we are going to be discovering uh, many, many things and look forward to in the future. And of course, it's a building. So uh, we just refer to it as MSABD and we are going to be trying to break the old hat of everyone calling these buildings meat labs, including what we used to call this one for the past 90 years. So, yep. Um, yep. Uh, well, good luck on apologies, that. Apologies, but uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, I thought I would just go through a few slides and show a couple pictures, because uh, um, that's pro probably the best way to explain what the building is. But in, in by and large, uh, a very lofty vis vision, um, uh, which was designing and constructing the best land grant university meat science facility in the country uh, by incorporating the spirit of UW and the needs of the stakeholders. And that alone, I think, is really the core foundational piece for why the building exists, why the program exists, and, and how the program is going to uh, come alive in the new building. And of course, right with any new building, any new reinvigorated program, we have to be leaders and leaders in, in everything that we do. And as Kevin alluded to, you can't be you 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 can't be you can't be everything to everybody, but you can pick and choose and put a lot of em emphasis, energy, and effort in certain areas. So, with our missions, uh, core missions, train the next generation meat industry leaders, and this includes uh, people that need to be working in plants like Jake's and 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 and, 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 and many others scattered across uh, the state of Wisconsin. Uh, support innovative research interests. Uh, for sure through interdisciplinary collaborative efforts as well as a number of, of other ways and then provide outreach education that continues to foster wholesome uh, uh, production of, 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 of products for consumers. So, right, this touches on the teaching, research and outreach missions of the Land Grant University. Uh, and there's many, many people that uh, are involved and should be involved and, and will be touched by this building. Uh, and those are the stakeholders, uh, which, in, which, which includes 
anyone involved in the meat industry in, 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 in the, uh, as, a, as a scientist, as, 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 a, as a business operator, as a consumer. Uh, and we have a very lofty effort and goal of, of uh, really uh, staying true to um, providing uh, interaction support and value to stakeholders. Um, the Wisconsin meat industry, is, as, as some may or may not know, and I've commented earlier, it is a very important industry in the state of Wisconsin. It's a very top ranked industrial uh, um, um, uh, industry, um, top five for sure, and it kind of teeters depending on, on how the other industries uh, are doing, uh, but lots and lots of productivity. Over 400 meat and poultry processing businesses. Uh, this does not include all the support businesses, the companies that make equipment or ingredients or other technologies. So um, you can see that there's 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 multipliers that really expand on 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 how vast this industry is, and there's lots of people that are employed, uh, providing a tremendous and a significant economic impact in the state of Wisconsin. So it's a, you know, one might say tongue in cheek, kind of a big deal. Meat industry has been around Wisconsin for a long, long time, right? Since well before it was a state, and it continues to thrive and. Right, there's uh, great, great things looking for the future. Uh, meat science in general, um, for those that are uniquely knowledgeable um, or, or, or really in, in, in depth with what with meat science is, you know, the discipline touches on lots of other disciplines, right? So if you look at this, at this diagram, meat science being, being in the center, and then you look at some and these are just examples of other disciplines that have some interaction with meat science, whether it be uh, 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 veterinarians or food scientists, microbiologists, biomedical sciences, businesses, regulatory agencies. You know, there's touch points, right? This is a food stuff, and that food is produced from animals. That food uh, is involved with lots of different facets along the way, and then that food uh, makes its way to consumers. Uh, and then there's all these other offshoots, right? Such as the biomedical stuff that was discussed a little bit earlier. So to kind of wrap up the building, uh, uh, here's a, a picture of the front of the MSABB building, Meat Science Animal Biological Discovery. Uh, a few pictures on the inside to show some of the cutting edge uh, new, newness. And, and uh, we're uh, very, very excited to uh, uh, start having more stakeholders utilize the facility in a number of ways, either teaching research Outreach, as well as as well as some others that 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 that, that we're also pursuing, uh, the the building uh, includes a, a a fully functional retail store called Bucky's Varsity Meats, uh, state of the art uh, lecture uh, facilities. So this is how we teach meat science in the future with this uh, big pane of glass and uh, place that you can hang carcasses or do meat processing under the comforts of refrigeration, so you can do things safely while having students and stakeholders in classrooms uh, held at normal comfortable levels. And of course, have, of course, the facility has, 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 has uh, enormous research capability as well as significant processing. So this last slide just shows uh, an excerpt of a couple rooms, a couple areas in the building, uh, kind of a sneak peek, if you will, of what things look inside. And the building is, on the production side of the building was designed to mimic or exceed uh, the highest levels uh, that are uh, or the highest levels and standards that are used in the industry uh, and then take those into the in, 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 into our space, bring it on campus and um, expose students, uh, train the industry and of course conduct wonderful teaching research and outreach uh, activities uh, inside that building. If you're interested, there's a whole bunch more information uh, at uh, meatsciences.cals.wisa.edu. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's the little MSABD spiel. Well, uh, thank you. I, think, I don't think a lot of people um, are fully aware of the, the, what that lab is going to be like yet. Um, it, it, just given the, the shutdown of campus and we're slowly reopening and I can't wait to get in there and see it myself. And I'm particularly excited about the, the meat, having that there. Um, you know, ice cream is great and we got Babcock. I'm glad to see there's a um, equivalent of the, the Babcock Hall ice cream. We'll have a, I don't know what you're going to call it, the MSABD um, burger. I don't know what it'll be. Um, sausage or bacon. We'll see. No, um, Bab, we'll have to come up with something. Um, 
No, I well, I, I, I'm really excited about that. And we saw the um, Dairy Innovation Hub has been a lot of funding by the university and the state, um, a lot of activity. And I think the same thing's happening on meat science. Those figures were very large, that $15 billion impact, just to help people understand um, the dairy industry and Steve Deller's numbers. Um, he, you know, $105 billion impact for the agriculture in the state of Wisconsin. Um, about $46 billion was... Um, was um, dairy, there's um, meat there at about 15. So it gives you a sense of how important meat is here. And beef is our number two commodity after milk, um, beef, and then it's corn and soybeans in terms of farmer farm gate value. So meat is very important to the state of Wisconsin. Well, I'd like to talk briefly here with Jake and um, Kevin. They're both on, you can go on there, you can look at the, 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 the new lab has a advisory council for the, the new lab. And um, Jake is on it, and Kevin, as well as other people. If you know the meat industry in the state, you'll recognize several names on there. Uh, Jake, someone like Silers, what? How do you see the lab helping a business like your own um, in, here? And what's your role on the advisor council? Um, just talk about your experience with the new lab. Well, uh, first of all, I guess my my place was they asked me a small processor in Wisconsin and um, the United States on the app side. Um, and I'm very excited for the new meat lab. I'm excited to be there, see it, work in it, uh, train in it, teach in it. It's, it's going to be awesome. I, I can't wait. My biggest push is, like Jeff said, and he agrees, or Kevin said, that we need to get people involved in industry. So I want to get people in that meat lab, and then I want them to get interested in something. Um, you know, I want, I want Jeff to develop programs, you know, that inter in, uh, introduces slaughter cutting, packaging, sanitation, sausage making, retail. And, and then we get those, you know, maybe they're gonna be shorter courses or, or introductory courses, and then we lead them into what they wanna do in the future and hopefully get them into business like mine and, and Kevin's also. But we don't, we see more people going through um, University of Wisconsin and then getting their PhD and, and moving on to larger companies. Um, it's my goal to try to get some smaller sessions, classes, curriculums, whatever, to get them just interested, get them the broad basics, and then send them out to industry such as businesses like myself. That's my goal. Um, thanks, thanks. Um, Kevin, the same question to you. Um, you're on the advisory council and you represent a different size sector um, of, in the meat processing industry here in the state. What do you see as sort of like what you would like to get um, out of the, the for your industry or just broadly for the state? Uh, um, anything you want to add or re reflect on? Yeah, well, I, I think there's three things that we look at when it comes to uh, UW Madison and the Meat Science Center. I mean, the first one Jake alluded to, which is education, right? It's, it's traditional students coming through the program of meat science, and they'll eventually be coming into the workforce. Uh, we hire a lot of uh, those uh, students coming out. Uh, that's certainly very, very important to our mission but also not traditional students. It could be short courses, it could be special uh, symposiums that the university puts on with that great facility. So there could be adult learners that also go through that take an interest in our field. So education is a huge, huge area. I mentioned before research as well. I think the university is well situated to be a great research hub. It's not just meat science, it's microbiology. It perhaps could be chemistry. Uh, there's other allied areas around meat science, and because Madison's structure of having everything kind of under one campus, I think they're uniquely positioned to really help research and develop new discoveries. And hopefully these discoveries lead to commercial applications, right? Uh, research is great, discovery is great, but eventually you want to take it to market to be able to, to make a business out of it. And I think the last area is this biologics area, which is very new. It's probably not very well understood by a lot of people, but it's, it's really quickly growing and emerging in the marketplace. Not so much in the food space, but more in the medical space again. But we need to understand that, that a large portion of the animal as we harvest an animal is in the byproduct space. You know, call it 30, 40 percent, depending on the animal. There's wonderful materials in there, and the effort has to be placed around understanding what those materials are how they could be used and how they can turn into new products. And that's really an exciting part for us. So the, the animal biologics component, uh, given the venture side for Johnsonville and what Madison I think can do in time to be a center of excellence is really quite important to us. Really no different than what the pet food industry has done. You know, traditional meat science is about meat color and tenderness and flavor. Pet food has really come on the scene the last number of years and uses a lot of byproducts. It's a brand new industry. And I think the medical and pharma space is really at the cusp of being that next next kind of open frontier to use animal products 
and applications in these industries. Well, thank you. I never thought of the that you know we've got the, the medical school is obviously good here as well, and um, I never thought of that connection. Um, maybe we have a comparative advantage in that. And and this is for uh, Kevin again. I'm sort of thinking about this. I've had a long conversation with uh, someone. I don't want to explain who, but um, it. We were talking about sort of the where Wisconsin's role is in broadly. I work here at the university, our undergraduates, and there's a large sucking sound. A lot of our ag business students, they go to, um, you know, they end up in places like Chicago, Minneapolis, maybe Denver, um, you know, and some would go back to the state here. And I, I always kind of wonder where is an, for an ag business or somebody with skills in the ag industry broadly, you know, meat science or um, various other sciences, what are we, are we competitive? How do we compete out? And I'm very curious, this is putting on your um, um, Johnsonville hat to think about how competitive are we as a state? Are we just competitive for new plants? What about their, our R&D entrepreneurship and corporate leadership? I'll start with you and I just kind of want to hear your thoughts on that. Are, how competitive is Wisconsin in corporate I, I America? Think, I think we have a lot of room to improve there, quite honestly, Paul. I, I, think, um, I think Wisconsin's a fantastic state. I grew up here, lived here most of my life. It's a fantastic state, quality of life, all those things, especially now with COVID, I think people are kind of rethinking their personal life. So I think Wisconsin has a lot of things going. I do think there's a lack of capital. I think there's a lack of cash coming in. There's a lack of startups in the state. Uh, so when it comes to purely venture and startups and new businesses being created, I think we have a lot of opportunity to grow there. So what will change that? Well, we got to get some of the, the monies from the coastal areas to come inward. And I think how we do that is we can win because the dollar goes farther in Wisconsin, but actually in the Midwest than it does in the coastal areas. So you can start a business, you can, you can invest cash, it tends to go farther. And I think the other point that I think we need to really focus on is talent. Um, so infusion of cash, more startup businesses, we need to create a deeper ecosystem around investment and venturing. And then talent, we need, we need people who are really interested in this space. And I think that's where the university can help fill that void is creating this energy and momentum around food, in this case, meat. And if there's a startup community that's more robust than what it is today, I think younger folks coming out are gonna see Wisconsin as a destination, a place to be and have a great career. And I think if we focus on those two areas, that will go a long way in creating more of a destination for Wisconsin for the meat industry. That's a good point. Um, I mean, here in Madison, they push the pharmaceutical, but I think um, the medicine in general um, as a startup. We've been starting to make some splash in that space nationally, but I think you're right. Um, it's broader than that. We can get to the rest of the state and there's, it's more than just um, um, medicine, biomedical stuff. Um, and we, the, the Dairy Innovation Hub has got some arms that focus on some of those activities you talked about. They've already funded a grant um, in the area. They had a student contest trying to get people excited about food innovation, and that was in the dairy, but I don't see why we can't expand that. Um, I want to move back to Brenda. She's been silently, quietly waiting here. This is a thing we hear a lot, and we've only got about five, ten minutes left here. Um, this is this shows up, you know, in, in meat, and we saw farm prices for livestock just collapse um, as processing capacity was lost. And at the same time, these consumer prices are going through the roof. We saw the empty store shelves and just high prices. Um, this gap between the farm price, what the farmers get in and the consumer, someone's making money off of that, it seems like. Um, is this just, the, what's what's going on there about this gap? Um, is, it, is it legitimate? Is it is it okay? Or is it just to be expected? Any thoughts on that? Um. Yeah, we did. If you look at 2020, we saw significant changes in uh, the margins right now, the difference between what was the retail, say, for example, beef price and that finished or that live cattle price, right? Um, it, it, a lot of that had to do with, unfortunately, just the way the, the system was working right then. Um, it just happened to be that the shutdowns uh, for um, those packers came at a time when we had a large number of cattle that needed to be processed. Um, and it also came at a time when the um, consumer was demanding more uh, retail beef. Um, and so what happened was those packers were shut down and there's a lot of animals that are out there ready to be harvested. Um, and th there was nowhere for them to go um, or they had to find alternative places for them to go. And so then that really collapsed that price. Um, and then on the other hand, Consumers, as we saw, they started doing some panic buying. Um, they changed what they were buying, but they also were like, hey, we'll, we'll buy it at this time. So those retail prices really skyrocketed. 
The difference is, is does it mean that anyone was taking advantage of anyone else? Um, remember, just because the, you're looking at the, the difference between retail price and um, what was paid for that final animal, doesn't necessarily that translates into uh, like massive profits for some of those larger packet, packers. Because um, as, as any of these guys can attest, when you're looking at those packers, one of the biggest things is to be able to uh, maintain a, a full booking, right? And so if you're not slaughtering at your capacity, then basically you're gonna have a lot of costs that you just can't cover. And since they ended up having to cut down a lot of their um, packing abilities, then that really kind of also, um, it didn't mean that just because the margins between the live cattle price and the retail price were so great that these packers were experiencing just hand over, you know, just great amounts of profit, all right? Just simply because they didn't have the capacity there. Now, on the other hand, do we see that? Um, we have seen that packers have had more leverage, even pre-COVID, um, we've seen that packers were having more leverage over the those finished animal producers. And a lot of that has to do with the um, limitations that we saw on those packing, um, on the packing plants. We just didn't have enough slaughter capacity. We have started in a nationally perspective, we have started adding some of that slaughter capacity. And as we look at on the beef side, as we start declining that beef herd, um, with the addition of the slaughter capacity, with the um, decrease in the herd size, that, that leverage is gonna start shifting back again to that um, fat cattle producer, but it's just gonna take a little while yet before that happens. Yeah, and that's the hope for higher prices for the farmer's perspective. I mean, the higher beef prices mean, or and livestock prices mean cost for the processors, of course, but and consumers. Well, thank you. Um, this is, we only have a few minutes left, and so I'd kind of like to think exports are we're big in grains, or exports are big in um, dairy, and we're also becoming more a part of livestock as well. And, but it's not just exports. I'm, I'm kind of I'm thinking more. Um, I'm thinking Kevin's talked about it some, but I'm thinking. Jake here and or Jeff to talk about where do you see some growth opportunities for Wisconsin meat processors? Um, is somebody like you, um, Jake, are you thinking, I don't, I don't, I'm assuming you don't have a medical um, look, thinking about new things to do with your um, livestock, those byproducts. Uh, wh what do you see for new opportunities um, and, and how do we get there? Um, and maybe Jeff, you have some perspective as well. We'll start with you, Jake. Any thoughts on what some new opportunities for someone like you, um, your kind of a business? Um, I guess my my future thought right now is to build a new facility um, to increase capacity in slaughter. Uh, the demand is there, and I feel that since this whole COVID has hit, that it really put perspective in the consumer's eyes of where their meat comes from. And that's not just in Wisconsin, that's all over the country. So the buying of beef and pork from the farmer has gone through the roof and there's just not enough processing facilities to go around. So I feel that if we, if we can build a new facility, I mean, I bet you it would be at capacity before you knew it. Um, obviously we're booked out two years, but um, that's gonna then give a direct, a direct link from the consumer right to the farmer and for the farmer to get a little more money. That's, that's my goal. I see. That's and my thought. What 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 one product is your big seller? You think um, you're gonna your new facility at least the well, gonna be right off the interstate. Uh, you're gonna put a store up there maybe if that's what you get. What you what's your big seller? You think uh, like in our retail store? Yeah yeah yeah. I would say by far our largest seller is our bacon. That is our bacon. our biggest main right. seller is our bacon. I'll start yep. looking for it when I drive by up there now. Jeff, do you have anything <laughs> to add? Um, anything you sort of see as new opportunities that Kevin and or Jake hasn't mentioned yet? Yeah, I do. I, I, I kind of jotted down and thinking about three. One is uh, I see opportunities for establishments in Wisconsin to be more diversified. And Wisconsin is a, has, has a really strong reputation uh, for uh, uh, doing industrial work in the, in the scope of, of meat processing. You know, Wisconsin is very well known for the quality and the ability and the, and, and, and the tech, technical capacity to produce products, uh, as well as being innovators, right? We have many companies in the state of Wisconsin that are, are, are leaders in innovation, of course, being one of those, but, but, and, and, and there are others. 
So I see opportunities for, for, for operations or establishments at all sizes, small, medium, and large to diversify, right? We've seen a big push in the past 10 years or so, especially trickling down to the small operations for co-packing. So someone or a group of investors or a company says, hey, we want to make this product. They can't, they, they need to find a place to do it. They reach out to a plant in, in Wisconsin and they, whoop, boom, all of a sudden they're producing product that does not have their name going on it, right? It's, 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 it's being co-packed. The second is, I think there's, there's gonna be a, 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 a lot of opportunity for new plant construction, especially focused on meeting the uh, local uh, demands uh, driven by harvesting animals and our just lack, lack, huge lack, lack, lack of, 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 of harvesting capacity. And then, and then thirdly, I think this is where we all come together and it's what things beyond meat, right? How can we harness the horsepower at UW uh, Madison and other campuses, right? River Falls and 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 um, and so forth, uh, Platteville. Uh, and how can we how can we help uh, support the next uh, initiatives that continue to keep Wisconsin meat industry at the forefront of being innovators, thinkers, producers, and really ultimately leaders. That slide's gonna be showing. All right. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm just getting out of time here. Um, but I appreciate that. And I think you're right. We have a good industry here. We need some capacity building. There's ways. Um, everyone's talked about that. And I think you're right. We got to move beyond meat. Um, there's more to it than that. The one thing I think is that the other thing is the, the Dairy Innovation Hub really emphasizes this, the collaboration, the need for it to start more between UW-Madison, UW-Platteville, and UW-River Falls. And I think the meat science industry or um, scientists, we're going to see more of that as a byproduct of that dairy innovation hub will bubble over into more collaboration on this, on meat issues. And I think broadly, I think that's a great thing. Um, I want to thank you all for participating and we're going to move into all we have left is there's going to be a, a final slide that's shown that's going to have a web link on it. All these are recorded and it'll take us a little while to process them, process them, the slides. Um, and then, um, and so I, I want to thank you again, all Brenda, Kevin, um, Jake, and um, uh, Jeff to, for taking the time to do this. And we'll reach out and um, take a look at that slide. It'll show you where we can get all the talks, not just the, the meat panel and livestock panel, but also the grains and um, uh, dairy panel as well. So thank you, everyone. That concludes our first virtual um, Wisconsin Ag Outlook Forum, and we'll see you next year. I am hoping in person here on campus or a different venue. Thank you.